Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Double Jab. I'm Dave Bontempo along with Rob Scott. And we are all happy and excited, Rob, that Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame induction weekend is now creeping closer. We're officially into May and uh, the celebrities and the lineups uh, all being solidified. And it just seems like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing it from people, too, that, uh, hey, uh, congratulations. Uh, can't wait to see this uh, Hall of Fame weekend, May 26, 27, and 28. Well, I, I think the key thing that um, what you just said, the key thing is that it's the whole weekend. So it's uh, from the 26th to the 28th, uh, the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame is going to bring, uh, It's a, if you're a boxing fan, if you're a boxing follower, if you're a boxing, even if you're an inside guy, uh, the, that weekend, the Memorial Day weekend, Atlantic City is the place to be. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, acbhof.com, information on getting tickets and you know three separate events also a program in which you could tie it together the first ever Lang City Boxing Hall of Fame I'm excited and you know the idea is uh, hey you could bring people in for the weekend and the first one on a Friday night is at a rooftop at Claridge, right, looking out over the ocean, the first, uh, like the first meet and greet. It's like a meet, yeah, exactly. It's like a meet and greet where, you know, it's a little, it's downplayed to a certain degree where, you know, we just, just meet uh, certain fighters, uh, for certain people, uh, inside boxing people that, you know, we can all just talk and we can all just uh, get together and discuss what we're about to go through on the next two days. Because like I said, the uh, the Hall of Fame induction weekend, it, um, the, the show itself, or shall I say that Sunday, uh, which you're you're a part of because you're going to be inducted it's going to be i mean it's going to be crazy well i know firsthand that people are changing their plans and coming from different parts of uh, the tri-state area for several reasons and also you know, some of my own family members are changing and of course lou duva uh his family all up in that north jersey area they are coming down and everybody are rearranging schedules and also a gala on saturday night and that's a big thing the gala on Saturday night, the red carpet event. I mean, uh, Saturday night is, is really going to be uh, a, a big, uh, a huge night uh, because, again, you're going to meet a, a lot of, of the fighters that, you know, people have grown up on, uh, promoters that people have grown up on, Don King, uh, Mike Tyson, Larry Holmes, um, uh, the, yourself. There, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to be there that is going to make this event just, to, you know, like I said, it's going to be a phenomenal event. And Facebook? Twitter page, acbhof.com. How else uh, people can get the information they need to well, become part you, of this? You can definitely get uh, all the information that you need. You can definitely get it off of acbhof.com. That's Atlantic City Box and Hall of Fame.com. Um, you can definitely get off of that. You, we have our Twitter page. We have our Facebook page. But we also have our blog, which is uh, uh, acbhof.com wordpress.com and uh you know for for a blog uh that i deal with and um you know between all those you can find all the information that you need uh for that weekend okay it's coming up and i'm sure that we're going to see a lot of you that weekend you mentioned a few heavyweights tyson holmes and the boxing world just got a gift a shot in the arm from a phenomenal heavyweight championship fight over the weekend that actually lived up to and exceeded expectations with the Joshua scoring that victory over Klitschko and it just left everybody saying ah oh, how good that was well let's think you've been the boxer for many years and you know what probably one of the the it's almost like a cliched type saying is that you know when the heavyweight division is dead then boxing is dead Saturday night the heavyweight division was alive and kicking, and which means it, it, it spells good for boxing. Uh, I think that from this point on, you know, with the fight next week and fights coming up, uh, I think boxing, uh, uh, it's, it's, we're not on life support. I think that we're, we're alive and kicking. We're, we're doing calisthenics. <laughs> I was trying to go back and think, when is the last time you felt that satisfied after watching a heavyweight fight where it all came together? Because the other concept of the heavyweights is when, when they don't want to engage. It, it be, people have such high expectations that it disappoints them, but they had high expectations Saturday, and they were fulfilled. Well, one thing about this fight, um, as opposed to other fights, is the, the, the significance as far as, like, it, it was for the heavyweight championship. It's for uh, a, a passing of the guard, if you will. Um, I think that th those things uh, make this fight even more, you know, because we have fights that, 
you know, aren't heavyweight, uh, aren't championship fights that are decent fights. But when you consider Vladimir Klitschko, who's ruled the heavyweight division for so many years, and we have the upstart, or shall I say, the new champion um, in Joshua, who, I, you know, coincidentally, I, I met him in, in England when I was uh, supervising the fight um, a couple years ago, and uh, great guy. Great, great guy. I mean, uh, and it's funny because when I got off stage, uh, because uh, we were doing conducting the weigh-in, and when I got off stage, I bumped into him, and it was a thing like I bumped into him, like, and my <laughs> my face was in his chest, and I'm like, look at this guy right here, this big guy. You know what I mean? And but big doesn't mean that you're going to be good. He proved the other night that not only is he good, but he also he he, he knows how to dig deep. I it. it kind of made me feel like a, it was sort of like a George Foreman and Ron Lyles thing, uh, except that, you know, it, it, it didn't meet that expectation, but at the same time, it met a, a, an expectation from a, um, from a Joshua standpoint that, you know, who knew that he had the, the, the guts and the ability to weather the storm that he weathered. And Get he, off the canvas and win. People love to see the big guys do that. Oh, my that. God. And, and with... He's a promoter's dream. I mean, yeah. he's a good-looking guy, big guy, he's knocking everybody out. What, what more do you want? Not only from a promoter's standpoint, but from a fan standpoint. Well, he's doing, he did on Saturday what people have been expecting Deontay Wilder to do in filling that void when he became champion in 2015. And his fights have been very good. And he's another guy, when you just go up to him, you and Deontay Wilder, tremendous young man. Yes. Nice, uh, nice speaker, very good image for the heavyweight division to project out to people because that's what boxing needs is people that can identify with and be accessible to the regular fans, even just someone coming walking by, or if he's Deontay Wilder or Anthony Joshua, hey, can I come say hi to that person? Well, the, w w one thing, um, you know, prior to this fight, I, I think they were basically on an even keel uh, because both of them, you know, they could put on their Riddler outfits and with the question marks because mm -hmm. they, the, both of them had question marks about them. Joshua, answered a lot of those question marks where Deontay still has those question marks. And I think that, you know, when they, when they get together, it's still going to be so it's, it's going to be an intriguing affair because you don't know what is going to come to the table from both fighters. Is it Joshua in the eyes of many people leapfrogged over Deontay Wilder yes. into that, into yes. that prominent and, spot. And rightfully so though. Yes. Rightfully yes. so. He beat uh, Vladimir Klitschko and you know, there are some people that harp on that Vladimir was 41 years old and that Deontay, or shall I say that Joshua didn't beat the best um, Vladimir because he's 41 years old. But at the same time, uh, Joshua is a work in progress. Vladimir didn't fight the best Joshua, in my opinion, I think that Joshua still has a lot to learn, and he's still going to be—he's—he hasn't reached his peak yet. So, and that's the scary part about it. And he still came out with the KO victory. So, you cannot control how old the other person is, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or, or what version of them that uh, that you are going to get. Well, we're just getting started here on Double Jab. We're going to take our first break, and then come back and. We'll talk some more with Rob Scott. We've also got some people calling in, special guests, rankings, a potpourri. Stay with us. His eyes were closed well before he hit the canvas. The uppercut was perfect, George. And not only that, he's getting his whole body into it. It's Tyson all the way here in round number one. Vicious shots to the body. And you're watching Double Jab, Dave Bontempo and Rob Scott. And we have a guest here, very special on so many levels to us here in Atlantic City. A boxer, a trainer of champions, an analyst, reality show man, an author, and uh, one of our people, John the Iceman Scully. John, how are you, man? I'm real good. How you doing? Nice to hear your voice. Hey, which of those references uh, is your favorite realm when you <laughs> consider yourself and, and what you've been in boxing, John? 
You know, I uh, I always consider myself a fighter. I could, you know, even when I was training fighters, uh, you know, you know Chad Dawson or whoever, I always consider myself a fighter training another fighter. I always I always relate to them on that level, and you know, you know, I mean, there's there's nothing like being the fighter. That's uh, once you once you've been the fighter, it's hard to it's hard to be anything else. Well, uh, John. Um, you know, uh, you know about the Atlanta City Box Hall of Fame. Uh, are you planning on coming out and uh, joining us and with your presence? I'm hopeful. Um, what is it, what is the date again on, on it? It's uh, May 26th through the 28th. Uh, May 26th, 27th, 28th. Uh, we have a lot of events, and uh, we definitely would love to have you come out, come through. Okay, well, I didn't realize. Oh, I didn't realize, oh, I didn't realize it was a, a, a several day thing. Okay, yeah. I, I, um, uh, if I can work it out, I will definitely be there. I'll actually get on that tonight after I leave the gym um, and see if I can work that out because uh, I love Atlantic City and uh, I love boxing, so it's a good, uh, it's a good fit. Let's talk about one of your uh, favorite Atlantic City moments, one of mine uh, doing your fights, John, was when you were here with Chad Dawson and Bernard Hopkins. It was a right. uh, really good uh, performance by him, a good game plan by you. Uh, could you take us through, as, as you approach that fight, knowing how wily Bernard Hopkins was and, and also what you did in the second half of that fight to kind of keep him glued in to his focus? Well, I'll I tell you, um, one thing that there was always uh, kind of a knock on Chad, I guess, by, from people was always that he would lose focus in fights. He would, he would, he would stray away, he'd become disinterested or what have you. Um, so that was a concern, uh, you know, as far as people around him and on his team, they kept telling me, like, listen, you gotta, you gotta keep him in the fight. You gotta make sure you do. So, um, going in, I, uh, initially I had planned on, on boxing because any, anytime you, in my, in my opinion, when you have a guy who has the skills and the natural skills and the reflexes of a guy like Chad Dawson, you should always maximize that. You should use that. You should uh, see that uh, you always use, uh, like force the opponent to deal with you. When you have those types of skills, the opponent is the one that needs to be forced to make adjustments. Um, now, we started out in the fight. If you remember, we started out, uh, and I thought Chad was boxing very well over the first few rounds. Um, I thought he was doing well. Uh, he was staying one step ahead of Bernard. But around, I, I, I've never watched the fight on tape, so I, I'm not sure, but I think it was around the fifth round that I noticed that even though we were still doing well, that Bernard, his experience was coming through and he was starting to close the distance. It looked like he was starting to set the ball in motion to kind of run Chad into some stuff, to, to set some traps for him. And I just, what I distinctly remember is after one of the rounds, I believe it was the sixth or the seventh, and I said to Chad, listen, everything we worked on, everything I told you, forget it. We're going to change it. We're going to go the opposite direction. I want you to put your hands up. I want you to use your double jab, your triple jab. We're going to back Bernard up. We're going to get him on his heel. We're going to throw him, throw him a, a complete curveball. And uh, as I recall watching the fight, um, from that moment on, the tide really changed. And I just think Bernard couldn't couldn't handle the, the change in strategy and, and Chad backing him up. And I thought, as I recall, I thought the last three or four rounds we we pretty much controlled the fight, uh, as as I remember it. Well, and it was basically a couple hundred yards away from where we are right now <laughs> in, oh, okay. in 2012. So yeah, it, it's always good to hear your perspective on that. Well. Uh, John, I don't, I don't know if you remember, um, but I was um, one of the guys, well, I was the guy who um, I called ahead um, uh, and I pulled a couple strings so that you guys could get straight back. And I was with you guys in the uh, the ER room because he had to go uh, and get stitched up, uh, meaning right. uh, Chad. Uh, I was there. Right. Um, but last week we, we discussed about trainers who basically – you know, they, they haven't been given their credit for certain victories uh, because some trainers, you know, let's, let's face it, there are some trainers who get a lot of the shine where, you know, basically that shine may not be warranted. Um, but that was one of the nights that you deserve some shine. Um, how how um, uh, did that affect you in the sense of being a trainer, in the sense of, like, there are so many trainers that they have one guy and then all of a sudden they become a hot commodity? Um, that right there, do you 
train Chad Dawson to do what he did that night. Um, how did that affect your training in the sense of like uh, meaning get more clients, if you will? Well, you know, I, I actually uh, uh, got several calls from different guys uh, around the world that actually after that fight about training different people, um, which was, you know, kind of a surprise, but I, I thought it was very, very good, you know, cool. I, I was appreciative of it. Um, but but what, what made me feel good was people – um, people recognize, and, and again, I have never watched the tape, so I don't know exactly what happened, but I know that I had people, people I respect in the game, and they were emailing me and calling me and texting me, and they were saying, oh, great job. You uh, you know, in the second half of the fight, he, he started to drift, I guess, and, and you really kept him in in the fight, and you kept him on track, and, uh, you know, so that made me feel good that people – a that they noticed it, and B that it was respected people that that noticed it. So um, that that was that was kind of the thing that I took away from it is that uh, I got a, some some respect. I, I proved myself on a big stage, and uh, you know a lot of people before the fight. You know I had trained some guys like uh, Jose Rivera when he won the WBA title, and I had different guys like that. But obviously that was the biggest fight uh, with Chad and Bernard, and. I always told people, I think, I believe it was Nazim uh, uh, before the fight. I think he kind of alluded to, oh, you know, this is a different level and, uh, you know, we've been here before and you haven't. And what they don't understand about me is you have to understand, like, I, I really like boxing. I really love boxing. So I take it very serious. And if I'm training a kid 10 years old and he's in a junior Olympic fight in a, in a, in a room with 200 people watching, to me, that's just as big as a world title fight on HBO. So, so standing there in the ring before the fight with Bernard and, and Nazem when we were doing the pre-fight instructions, uh, it was the same to me as standing with a 10-year-old kid in a, in a community center getting ready to fight in the state finals. So none of that affected me. And, um, you know, luckily that, that was the case because I, 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 I did pretty well in the second half of the fight with Chad. So um, my thing was just getting, getting respect from people that I respect and they noticed it, and uh, you know that was that was probably the, the main thing that I took away from it. Hey, hey John, now how about the fighter fighter relationship in the training sense here? Because you are training guys, and you know at that time you know, you'd been a fighter recently. Now, how does that work, say, versus someone who is taking on a trainer who may be thirty or forty years older and who boxed back in the day or didn't box? What are the things that you bring to a a, a fighter trainer relationship as a fighter and, and what do you think are the keys to making that relationship click well i think um one one thing that i still do to, to this day and i actually did it uh two days ago um i still i still get in the ring i still spar i still keep myself in very good shape and uh i spar with the, the guys that i that i fought like i've sparred with chad many times i've sparred with lots of guys that i trained jose rivero we sparred a lot of and uh so I think I'm, I'm a different kind of trainer in that I run with them when we are training camp. I get up and I run with them and I do the exercises with them and I compete with them. You know, we do different drills and I, I do it with them. And sometimes we spar. And uh, so I think I, get, I have that going for me where, where I, like I said earlier, I always say I'm a, I'm a boxer who, who trains boxers. So I, I relate to them on a level. And luckily I've had a chance where – certain things have come into play in, in, in certain situations where I could relate to it and they knew that I could relate to it because I had been through it before. And, uh, and, I, and I'll, give an, I'll give an example. Uh, uh, as, and, and it wasn't something that I particularly went through, but, but as a boxer, from boxer to boxer. Chad, and, and normally I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this, but everybody knows about it. It was, it was a story they did. And, uh, but, but before he fought uh, one of the fights, he, um, he got dropped in the gym. And uh, it was like the second to last sparring session. He went down, so obviously he wasn't he wasn't very happy about that. And uh, and I remember telling him later that night we talked, and uh, I said, "Listen, I said, do you know what happened to Sugar Ray Leonard? The last last sparring session before he fought Marvin Hagler, and he had he had no idea. You know, I, I assume you guys know. Uh, he actually Ray actually got dropped by Quincy Taylor, uh, and and." So Ray went into the fight with Hagler. His last sparring session, he got dropped. So I used that as an example, and I said, "Listen, Sugar Ray Leonard could rebound uh, from a, from a slip up in the gym and beat a 
legendary guy and a, and a, and a the favorite like Hagler, then you know you, you've got a you've got you've got a precedent. There's a precedent. It's been done before. It's not something that's never been done before. And so, as a boxer and as a boxing historian and a guy who really follows the game, uh, he benefited from that and he, he appreciated that. So we had a good relationship in terms of that type of thing, where I could relate to him on on every level. And uh, me having been a boxer obviously made that made that possible. Well, John, John, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, um, piggybacking yeah. off of um, what, what Dave uh, Dave's question, um, in recent weeks, uh, the WBC came up with a rule that that and it's going against certain people like like a a, um, uh, a person. Uh, the, the the rule as far as the, the father and training yeah. their son uh, in, in the championship fight. That's a rule that, you know, it, it makes a lot of people scratch their heads. Um, does it make you scratch your head uh, um, in, in the sense of you being a trainer, even though you probably, you never trained your son, per se, in, in a right. championship fight? But at the same time, do you think that that's a significant thing, and do you think that, that w it was warranted for the WBC to, you know, come up with a rule like that? Listen, I mean, I'll tell you something. With, with the WBC, the WBA, and, and especially those two, uh, I haven't heard much about the IBF lately, but the WBA, WBA and the WBC, with the things they're doing, with the with these, you know, two different champions in the same weight class and the, the you know, different championships and their rules, they, these people are, I don't know if they're insane. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they're, what they're doing. I don't know who's making It's almost like, they're sitting around in a room somewhere, and they're saying, "You know what? We haven't made a new rule in a while. We got to do something." <laughs> and some guy goes, "Hey, let's—I uh, don't know—let's let's say that people who train their son can't work corner." And they go, "Yeah, yeah, let's throw that one out there. See what happens." It's insane. Like I, I don't look. When I heard about that, I thought it was one of my friends joking. I was laughing. I go, "Hey, you're crazy." And he goes, "No, no, no. Seriously, it's, it was on the internet today. It's a real rule." I don't understand why they would even contemplate that. I don't know what their theory is, but could you imagine when Roy Jones trained his father or Shane Mosley trained his son? Could you imagine telling those guys, No, 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 you can't you can't work for them. Like like who are they? I don't I don't even I don't know if they even have the the jurisdiction to do that. I don't but, know if they but, have the authority. To do but that. you know what, I, I can even take it a step further. Um it's it's not only a father and son, I mean, uh, and maybe you can relate to this uh, because I don't know how close you've been to your fighters, but there have been trainers that in the past that have been so close to their fighters that certain things like, like I, I always use Lou Duva as a measuring stick. Lou Duva has been in fist fights, uh, in, in championship fights or whatever. And that right there right. shows you his closeness with his fighters, his camaraderie with his fighters, that he's going to go down. If, if everybody's going to, if, if, if we're going to go down, we're going to go down together. And something that he could get away with in that era because, uh, yeah, they were allowed to lobby a little bit more, I think, and he was one of the best uh, at working the uh, at the officials for, for his fighter. Hey, hey John, I want to ask a couple of questions uh, on the idea of, for you as a fighter, take our fans inside now. It's between rounds. You as a fighter, what did you find was the most exceptional advice that you can use? And when you're also going to talk to a fighter, you've got one minute to get your point across. How do you use it? Do you try to focus on one point? How do you get that message across in a short time? Well, I tell you what, when I was younger, I thought that, you know, in the minute you have to tell the guy all these 10 different things. You got to tell him this, you got to tell him that. Don't forget this, don't forget that. Now I obviously realize that that's a waste. You have to just pinpoint a couple major things. You have to stay very calm. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, for me, I, I had several several different trainers over the years uh, work my corner. Uh, my towards the very end of my career, at the, at the very end, uh, Russ Amber. I assume you know Russ. Yes, Russ the cup man. Yep. Yep. Right, right. Well, Russ is also a very good trainer. You know, he brought up he brought Otis Grant from a kid to the WBO World Title, and Russ is a very good trainer. He he works with me. I've known Russ for years. I actually fought Otis as an amateur, and we all got to be friends after and. We're still friends to this day. Now, now Russ works with me at the end of my career, and I remember fighting and him in the corner. And what I liked, what me personally, what really was different about him as compared to every other guy that ever works in my corner, he talked to me like I was a world-class fighter. Like he talked to me like I knew what I was talking about, and we were just we were just talking. We were just relaying information to each other in the corner. It was very calm. You know, we talked like two guys who knew boxing, and 
this is what I think you should do. And, and I said, okay, we got it. Okay, good. And it was so smooth and so, so professional. Uh, and I really, I always remember that. And, and I, I utilize that as well. Um, with that being said, it all depends on the fighter. It depends on the different fighter. And, I, and I'll give you an example. I have a fighter. Uh, I mean, I mean, me personally. If you, my trainer years ago, I never get it's an it's a it's like an old cliche almost. But this is what he did with me in the corner. He said to me something to the effect of, uh, you know, look at that guy over there. He's trying to take food off your table. You know, like <laughs> like you know. And I remember thinking, and I was going. That guy's not trying to take food off. That guy's not thinking about my family. Like, he doesn't care about me. You know, he's not. It's just ridiculous. You know what I mean? But that doesn't work on me. It does. It did not. And I told him after. I said, "Listen, that that type of psychology does not work on me. I promise you. It's, it's a, just tell me what I need to do, right? Now, given that, but but by the same token, you have to know your fighter. I worked corner years ago. I was fighting. There was a kid by the name of Terry Shea who ended up. He ended up basically a journeyman. You know, he didn't he didn't do much in his career. But I tell you what he did do. When 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 Sid Vanderpool fought Bernard Hopkins on HBO, Sid Vanderpool gave Hopkins a good fight. People forget that he, gave, he went 12 rounds. He gave Sid he gave Bernard a very good fight on HBO. At the time of that fight, his one loss was to Terry Say from Hartford, Connecticut, by a TKO. Terry stopped uh, Sid Vanderpool. I worked with Terry for that fight. Terry was my sparring partner. And our trainer couldn't go to the fight, so I took him. So I took Terry to the fight. Now, Terry was a street guy, uh, through and through. Like, you know, he's in prison right now, actually. Like, he's a street guy. That's just how he grew up. That's just how he is. So that's what he relates to. In Hartford, there's a street called Albany Avenue, the you know, worst street in Hartford. They call it the Ave. If you say, go to Hartford, say, where's the Ave? They'll know that you mean Albany Avenue. So we're going through the fight, and the fight is a close fight. But I see Terry starting to lose it a little bit. You know, Sid's starting to outbox him, and Terry's taking his foot off the gas a little bit. And I knew how I know how he is. I know how he grew up. I know his mentality. And I never forget it. I said to him between rounds, I said, listen, Terry, I said, we're on the Ave right now. You understand? I said, and that guy across that ring is trying to take everything you got. Now, you tell me, what are you going to do? And he's looking at me, and I tell you, the look on his face, it's like literally like he was on the Ave getting robbed that's what was happening to him wow. and he went out there and I, and I promise you he stopped Sid Vanderpool the next round you can look it up you can look it up on box track he stopped him in the next round and that was Terry that was and I knew that's how you had to talk to Terry because in his mind he was on Albany Avenue like he, you know it was almost wow. like he's like what this guy's trying to rob but if you, you did that with me I'd look at you like you were crazy like it would it would be a joke to me you have to know the guy. You have wow. to know who responds to what. You know what well, I mean? Yes. And I knew Terry. As a man, I knew Terry. Me and Terry fought each other twice in the amateurs. We sparred 100 rounds. I knew him. I know his mentality. So that's, that's the kind of thing that, that it pays to know your fighter. And I would say you have to know your fighter because some people, that, that stuff doesn't work. It doesn't, it, you know, it would, like if you did that to me, if you said, hey, John, we're on all the hell. I was like, are you insane? <laughs> Tell me what I need to do. If I need to throw the hook, you know. For me, that wouldn't work at all. But to Terry, that's all it took. Well, John, let me ask you a question. Um, it's basically still going on what we're talking about right now, but we're making it even a more broad um, assessment of it. Um, you fought for the Light Heavyweight Championship in Germany. Now, I know a lot of people, right. the cliche thing is, is when people say that, you know, people can talk all they want to talk, but, you know, your corner and your fans can't get in there and fight for you. You're over there in Germany, and um, I, I know that probably, you know, he had more fans than you did. Um, yeah. But by him having more fans than you did, what, what give us a, um, a rundown on, on how it feels to fight in your opponent's um, backyard. Now, because like I said, it's not only uh, opponent's backyard, that's from town to town. But I'm talking about you in a totally different country and, uh, and fighting for the, heavy, uh, the light heavyweight championship of the world. How did that um, feel and how much did that play a part in w uh, the outcome? I get, I get to Leipzig, Germany. And I go to the mall on the first day, right across the street from the gym. I'm in the mall. I'm in like a department store, and I look up. Now you know how they have, you know how you have towels like beach towels, and you have like Mickey Mouse on them, and you know Superman towels, whatever. They don't just, you don't just bring white towels to the beach. They have a, they have a sign, you know, Farrah Fawcett Majors, whatever they got on it, right? 
I look up and they have beach towels with Henry Moxie on the towel. Like that's what I'm fighting. And I'm saying, this this guy, they have beach towels with his picture on. People are buying new beach towels with Henry Moxie on the towel. I said, Okay. I'm I'm the underdog. I'm definitely I'm definitely fighting the guy with the beach towel. So I know that. And then every day every day, like it's different it's it's a bit different there than it is here in the States, uh Every day they had articles about him in every paper. Picture. They had articles about me just because I'm fighting him. But they had articles about Henry. They had pictures of Henry. They had pictures of Henry eating a eating a piece of cake, you know, like whatever he did. Every movie made, they were covering it. And uh, you go to the press conference. You go to a press conference here in the United States for, for a title fight, maybe other than the big, big fights. But for a regular title fight, you know, you're going to get 10, 12, whatever, reporters, TV. You go there, it's like the Academy Awards. You know what I mean? There's just lines and lines and lines of TV cameras. So I knew then that this is different. This is a different vibe. This is a different situation. Uh, when I come out, I didn't realize at the time, but in, in Germany, they, they don't boo. When they when they want to boo, they, they whistle. That's their version of a boo. And uh, when I came out of the dressing room, there was, there was 14,000 people, and it, it looked like 100,000 from, from the angle that I came out of the dressing room. And I just remember the whistles were so loud that it was almost like it could break glass. You know what I mean? Like, like it was piercing. And I was just saying, like, man, it was, your mind plays funny tricks on you. Like, I was actually saying, like, man, why, why do these people hate me so bad? Like, I'm a, I'm a pretty nice guy. I'm a good person. Like, why, why do these guys hate me so bad? They don't even know me. And that's what it was like walking through the ring. I just could feel the, the hatred. It, you know, they're, they're, and, and not even not even to say hatred, but I could just feel like they were definitely for Henry, and they were not sympathetic to me. And um, so it was it was a different vibe. You know, it, 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 when you go to you know England and you go to Australia and you go places like that, that's one thing you can say. Like fans over there are, are better than United States fans. They're they're more vocal, they're more passionate, they're more into their guys. Now maybe that's because the United States we have NBA and major leagues, and we have wrestling we have everything so many guys so many sports so many superstars in, in athletics whereas germany is so small you could drive from one end of the country to the other but whatever the case is they uh when they're behind the fighter they're they're behind the fighter 100 percent, and there's no uh, no diverting from that i can relate to that a little bit i, I was in uh, stuttgart to do a fight a heavyweight championship fight in 2007 and it's gigantic arena totally filled and the the stage show that was accompanying these guys going right. into the ring was was something else. And uh, you know, and you you mentioned Henry Maskey at uh, Virgil Hill, who went over there uh, to fight him. Uh, that was supposed to be Maskey's retirement fight, and from that fight came the classic Bocelli song "Time to Say Goodbye," which is the biggest song ever in Germany. So you were connected to the fighter that was part of that, John, <laughs> and you weren't even on the well, F. Well, no, well, not just that, but I sparred with Henry for that fight. I was, I was there. I was sparring with Henry for the Virgil Hill fight. Wow. Hey, you know, you're talking about something about relating to your fighters and knowing your fighters. Sometimes you know, we hear corner men tell the fighters, you won the last round, or you're up two, or you're up three. Uh, do you like that when you see it? Do you feel that maybe you can trust a guy one time, but if he's wrong about the score, maybe you don't believe him the next time? How do you feel about corner men interjecting their viewpoint of the score to a fighter? Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like it, and I'll tell you why, because most of the time, you know, many times you're wrong, like, uh, especially on individual rounds. You have no idea. Like, you're, what you're saying is, I think you won the round. You know, I, I'm not saying that they gave it to you because I don't know if they gave it to you. Um, you don't know uh, what it is. And and I don't, I personally, unless my guy's winning, you know, ridiculously easily, you know, just it's very obvious, I won't, I would never tell him, I will certainly never have him ease off, you know, try to try to take it easy because you never know. And, and you never know how close it is and, and, and he's going to have to push himself. And I don't want to get him into a frame of mind where, it's smooth sailing, and, and you know you get some guys they'll shut down in that in that situation, and they uh, they end up losing the fight. So I think you you need to keep a little bit of intensity, you know, in terms of making him believe. You can never say like, oh, you're way ahead, you know, just take it easy, you're way ahead. You know, you've got to always say, listen, I've had guys and I've told them, I said, listen, 
the tenth round coming up. We're going twelve. I said, I don't know how to have it. I, I have no idea. It's a close fight. You could be winning. You could be losing by a couple rounds. Either way, I said we have to. You always have to treat the last rounds like do or die because they they very well maybe. I mean, very few fights end up a one point difference. Every fight you watch, fight at watch on HBO, it's a two point difference, a three point difference, a four point difference. So you know these rounds. These, you know, you've got to push it. And, and, and I'll tell you another thing. I, I have a fighter. Uh, when you have a fighter going to the 12th round of a fight, I'm always perplexed. Any fight that goes in, it's the last round. You can you can burn it out. You've got to tell your guy you've got to win by knockout, unless he's winning way, way, you know, just ridiculously easy. Any fight that's a tough, close fight, you've got to win the win the last round. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But I've seen guys in what I considered relatively close fights, and they say, oh, you know, you got to just get through the last round, you know, just work, just, just work. And I'm saying, man, like, you don't know. There's, I mean, and history tells us. We don't know what the scores are. Uh, how many times have you seen a fight and you thought a guy won by two points and he ends up getting, you know, not getting the decision. He lost by three points. So everybody, once the last round comes, you've got to push your guy. You know, that's why sure. we train hard to, to do that. But you don't... It's funny to me that you don't see that very often. You don't see guys very urgent going into the last round of big fights. Hey, John, stay with us. We're going to take a break. You're up by two. And when we come back, I want to ask you some light heavyweight questions and then uh, uh, this weekend's fights and, say, uh, training with uh, Chavez Jr. Stay with us, John. You stay with us, and we'll be right back on the other side. Hi, I'm Jessica. And I'm Karina. And, and we're, we're from Meet AC. AC. Today we are here to take you inside the Claridge Hotel's unique and wide-ranging meeting and event space. Now branded as the Radisson Hotel, the Claridge Hotel has transformed this historic property and its 500 guest rooms, which welcomes any type of guest. The Claridge Hotel offers over 100,000 square feet of newly renovated convention and event space. From corporate retreats to small conventions, Claridge can accommodate everything in between, and their highly qualified banquet staff will customize your event based on your requests. The new state-of-the-art conference center features 15,000 square feet of function space, including a 6,400 square foot room perfect for general sessions or small trade shows, as well as four smaller conference and boardrooms. The newly renovated Oceanfront Grand Ballroom offers breathtaking views of the Atlantic Ocean and the world-famous Atlantic City Boardwalk. With over 12,500 square feet, this stunning, architecturally designed ballroom is perfect to host your wedding or corporate event. Also Oceanside is the Ocean View Room, which is situated on the third floor and contains 5,150 square feet of space. This space is perfect for a general session or social gathering. The Celebrity Theater, situated on the third floor, is versatile enough to host almost any event imaginable. With banquet seating bringing its capacity to 550, it's perfect for your general session. From performing arts to boxing matches, the theater lends itself to every need. The main ballroom is located on the sixth floor and contains 2,200 square feet of pre-function space, which makes it adaptable for any corporate or social use. Also located on the sixth floor is the Southampton Room, which is adjacent to the main ballroom and pre-function space. This space can be used for a small meeting, hospitality room, registration, or office. Last but not least, View is the newest and first rooftop bar in Atlantic City. With its indoor and outdoor arrangements, this 360 degree view is fit for any type of small meeting, celebration, or pre-function space. With breathtaking views and delightful cocktails, attendees won't want to leave this magnificent space. Don't forget to visit MeetAC.com to book your next meeting or convention. And we're back on Double Jab, Dave Fontempo, Rob Scott, and talking with one of our favorite people, John the Iceman <laughs> Scully, who would totally enjoy your company. And John, uh, as a trainer, uh, I'd love to see what buttons you would push 
uh, to get the guy ready this weekend, uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. You talked earlier about knowing your fighter. Now, this is a guy who at some time seems to be a reluctant fighter as far as his training, yet he has the talent. He's going against Canelo Alvarez this weekend. How would you get through to Julio Cesar Chavez Jr.? You know, I mean, uh, uh, that's a mystery. I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing. Whoever's training him, I mean, it seems like physically they've done a pretty good job. I saw a picture of him the other day. Uh, he looks very, you know, physically. He, now, not, not that this uh, means anything when the actual fight comes, but he's obviously put the work in. He looks, he looks very good physically, and I think that's got to be on Canelo's mind. I think it's on everybody's mind that, you know, this guy really turned a corner and did something different this time. Um but uh, you know, I don't know the guy personally. Uh, but I, you know, I know guys like him, and uh, you know, but you'd, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to know him, and you'd have to figure out. With all my fighters, I, I get to know them on a personal level, and I try to figure out what bush, buttons to push. Um, and with with different people, it's different things. So you know, I can't say specifically because I don't know Chavez at all. But um, you know, I, that's what I would have to do. I would have, you know, you can't. That's why you can't just have a guy like a lot of fights. Especially, especially like club shows and stuff. A lot of these guys that fight, they they just met the guy. They worked their corner. They just met him that day. You know, they come in and oh yeah, help me in the corner, work my corner. And uh, you know, that's that's just uh, it's just very generic. You need someone who who knows you on on a certain level. And I think that's that's I know it's been for a fact. It's been proven many times in, in my own career as a trainer and as a boxer. Um, so whoever whoever trains trains uh, Chavez, it's not just training him to. To, to punch hard and to do this and to cut the ring off. You, know, you need to know how to talk to him to get him to do these things. Because with different people, like I, like I illustrated earlier, uh, some people, you know, one thing works and some people the total opposite would work. So it matters uh, how, uh, the guy's mental makeup and, and how you talk to him. Well, John, uh, boxing is, is not only mental, I mean, not only physical, but it's mental as well. The knock against Chavez has always been that, you know, the, the mental's not there. Like, you know, he, maybe he doesn't want to be where, you know, he doesn't want to be a fighter, if you will, because he has to do right. the things to, to be a fighter. Um, but that that's the that's the mental. To me, you said that you saw pictures of him where he looked good. I would like to see those pictures because a lot of the pictures that I've saw, he looked a little gaunt to me. Um, what do you think? Um, the, how, how much do you think that the physical is going to play in this part? Because you know, once uh, coming down to 164, and he has to get down to that weight because if he doesn't get down to that weight, it's what it's one million dollars a a pound uh, that he's going right. to be um, charged. So he has is to get down. Is that the weight? Are they, are they making 54? It's not a catch weight. I think, I, yeah, I think the catch weight was in the middle of those two. Yeah, I, yeah, I think sixty-four. I think yeah, it, it yeah, was sixty-four. Yeah. That that's the catch. That's yeah. the catch weight, sixty-four and a half, I believe. And and okay, okay, and, yeah. And by being one sixty-four and a half, Chavez is a big guy, and so yeah, and, yeah, and he definitely yeah. he's a big guy from a walking around standpoint. So he had to right. sweat and really, really put in the work um, to get down to one sixty-four. Now, how much do you think that he may leave in the gym? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, and that's a whole another another subject. My my whole career, uh, and Dave, you know, Dave was there for some of these fights. You may not even realize what was happening, but the, what 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 losing weight the wrong way, especially what it did to me in certain fights is almost criminal. Like I would I wouldn't even wish it on my worst enemy. So if you know, what making weight for some people is everything. And I have a feeling Chavez. Uh, Maybe that's why he looked as good as he did to me the other day when I saw the picture of him because uh, he realizes he can't go in with Canelo and have to lose two, three, four, five pounds the last couple of days because depleting yourself in that manner, I mean, it's almost as if you're saying, go ahead and just kill me, like, just, just knock me out because that, that's, 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 the, that's how you feel. Um, you know, any fighter who's gone through that, uh, will tell you it's it's among the worst things ever happened to him. And like in my life, I'm I'm 49 years old. If I could tell you the 10 worst things ever happened to me, two of them are losing weight for particular fights that, that I had in my career, and and what it what it made me feel like, and what I had to go through to actually make the weight. And expect, especially with uh, the the quality of his opponent, yeah, Canelo yeah. Alvarez. That's right, not that's right. not a person to go in there well, half step. Right. Well, not just that, not just the quality, but this is. Like, like, and we can't even fathom what it means for two Mexican icons to fight each other. Like, it's, 
it's a whole different level than it is here in America. Like, the, this is everything to them, the whole country. Like, I'd imagine that every household in Mexico is going to be watching the fight. It's going to be that type of fight. So there's a pressure there that we can't even imagine on top of making the weight and performing well. So, um, and I, I, I suspect that national pride is probably a big reason, a big boost as to why Canelo has put the work in as he did. Like I say, I, I'm not sure what picture you saw, but I saw one about two weeks ago. It looked like he was in a gym. He, had, he took his shirt off, and he was in, and many, you know, it wasn't just me. Like many people were commenting, and they were saying, wow, this guy, like, like uh, so that's an indication. He, uh, he's, uh, he's obviously ready because he looked very good. I don't know what he's looked like the last week or so, which, which, as I know very all too well, he could look like a totally different guy. Like I've seen guys on Monday look like a, you know, mammoth and, and then you see him literally three days later and you go this is a different guy like it's like a, they, they took they took the other guy away and brought this guy in his place um so that that's what losing weight can do to a man hey john let's talk about uh, you know the, we're going to have a, a slew of light heavyweights honored on hall of fame induction weekend you were light heavyweight trained light heavyweight champion uh, through the years uh, who are some of john scully's favorite light heavyweights well now, I was going to mention this, and it's funny you bring up the division. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but I actually have it in my scrapbook. Uh, but back in 1989, you actually did a story about myself and Archie Moore. I don't know if you remember yep. that. Hmm. Yeah, well, I have. I still have the article. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I just spoke to his daughter a couple of days ago because I'm he's supposed to be getting inducted into the Hall of Fame that they have out in California, and they want me to come out and uh, do a little speech. Uh, you know, on his behalf, um, Archie Moore obviously is, is up there. My 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 personal favorites, I would say Archie Moore, uh, Bob Foster in a big way, Michael Spinks, I think Roy Jones, and um, uh, but but uh, uh, another guy who I think may be the best, and a lot of people don't mention him as a light heavy for obvious reasons, is Ezra Charles. I think Ezra yes. Charles was a was obviously a spectacular light heavyweight, but. And many people don't even know that he was a light heavyweight at one time. Um, you know, he was uh, he was special. But light heavyweight, you know, historically has been a been a tremendous class. But uh, you know, for different reasons. I mean, Archie Moore was obviously great. But you know, you know, if Bob Foster hits you with the left hook, uh, you know, greatness may not necessarily mean anything. And then you got um, Kovalev and Ward for today, and how I, would I they was, match up? Are you just, going to go there with that? I was, yeah. yeah, I was just about oh, to ask Matthew, him, what do you think about and, them? But not just that. Yeah, what about Matthew Shah Muhammad and, and, you know, back in that day? Uh, you know, and Andrew Ward is, is, uh, is you know, he, he's very tricky. You know, I, I tell you a funny thing. When we, when we were fighting Bernard Hopkins with Chad, as a fighter and even as a trainer earlier on, I, I never used to, I didn't, it was, I found watching fight films boring, especially when I was boxing. I hated it. I never watched them. Uh, but watching for Chad, I had to watch the Hopkins over and over and over. And I see so many things that I never saw before. Like looking, when I looked at it as a fighter, I saw one thing. But when I look as a trainer, I see different things. And that's, I was actually able to pick out two or three really important things that we used against Hopkins. And I got that from watching the film. Now, that worked beautifully. When I watched the films of Ward uh, getting ready for that fight, it was just so perplexing because I was watching him and I was saying, you know, nothing really stands out. Like, he's not hes not like a Roy Jones. He's not like a Floyd Mayweather where anybody could watch him and go, wow, this guy's awesome. You know, you watch Andre Ward and you're going, man, what does he do? Like, what does he do to be so successful? And it's with him, I think it's just a thing of inches. You know, he's taking little steps and he's taking little movements and he's yeah. moving his head just a little bit. He doesn't do anything really dramatic that, that's very obvious. So when I was watching him, it was, I, I have to admit, it was hard to really pick out things to use against him because he's so subtle with, with his whole game. And, uh, you know, whatever he does, I mean, I was at the fight with Kovalev and, uh, you know, many people... I'm surprised that so many people had Kovalev winning, and some people had him winning big. Because being alive, seeing in, a, in person, I, I thought I thought Andy Ward won. I, I had Ward ahead at the end. Okay, hey, we're going to take a break, John. And uh, listen, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, we really enjoyed this long segment with you. It was a real treat. 
uh, to be with you and uh, uh, get your thoughts, especially with uh, you know, these great divisions and uh, your analysis of the different eras and uh, your insights in training fighters. We really appreciate you being with us tonight. And definitely come out for the Hall of Fame, John. Don't, don't forget that. Definitely come out for the Hall of Fame. We'd love to have you there. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I'm honored that you guys have me, and I'm going to definitely look into it. I'll look into it tonight, and uh, if I see you there, I'll, I'll come and approach you. All right. A great night with the Iceman. We've got time for one more break. We'll take it right now, and then we'll be back with you on the other side. your special event could walk on water. Suspended 100 yards out over the Atlantic Ocean, One Atlantic is Atlantic City's premier event venue for weddings, social gatherings, and corporate functions. With exquisite interiors and breathtaking views of the beach and Atlantic City skyline, One Atlantic is the region's most dazzling event venue. World-class gourmet catering and expert event planners help customize your one-of-a-kind event and deliver your unique vision. One Atlantic, bringing new dimensions to life's greatest celebrations. All right. The final round of Double Jab, if you will. <laughs> Down the home stretch, Dave Bontempo, Rob Scott. Now, mm -hmm. Rob. The knockout punch. Knockout punch. You know, <laughs> boxing has, uh, May has a tough act to follow with uh, what we saw on April 29th with the uh, uh, you know, Joshua and Klitschko, but starting with this weekend, this is a very good month set up for the month of boxing, yeah. for, for the world of boxing, starting with this one and also with Errol, Errol Spence at the end of the, the month. Well, th they always say that you're only as good as your last fight. I, I, that's said in the sense of a fighter itself, but as far as the sports go, as far as the sport go, uh, you're only as good as your last fight. And if that's the case, we're, we're headed to, to greatness um, and it's going to keep going on because we have good fights coming up. And the Errol Spence fight and the, the Kelbrook fight, I mean, uh, psst, that's – for anybody that knows anything about boxing, they, they, they should know that they should be clamoring at this fight. Errol Spence is somebody that a lot of people are thinking that is going to be the future of boxing. But Kel Brook, I always say that, you know, people can think what they want to think, but uh, the fighters have got to get in there. And as long as Kel Brook – feels that, no, 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 I'm the man. We are in for a good fight. I would call him the Errol parent. Right now, Errol Spence, uh, he, at the fight a couple of weeks ago, uh, and when all the bigger names are, are, are brought out, he's in the audience, mm -hmm. and, and that fight, uh, and uh, you know, I watched this kid over the last couple of years scoring the type of knockout to see a future champion is going to get. He'll take a pretty good name, and he'll stop him, and you'll say, well, that, that's a pretty impressive victory. Now, let me ask you something about the life of an inspector and a supervisor, which, which you do for the organizations. Uh, what is that life like? Uh, what is your job when you, when you get there? And, and what kinds of things are you dealing with? Well, basically, it's rules, rules, rules. You, you got to make sure that the, the fighters follow the rules. That's, that's my job. Uh, uh, they have to, you have to spell it out for them. Even a, a fighter who's been world champion for quite some time, there's still something that they'll come to you and they'll, they'll say, well, Mr. Supervisor, um, uh, can we do this and can we do that? Is this in the rules and that's not, is that in the rules? You know, and basically you have to have uh, knowledge of the sport, not only a knowledge of the sport, but knowledge of the boxing rules for that particular events because uh, different fights, the rules do change up. But for championship fights, uh, they always remain the same. And, you know, you have to basically be there and enforce the rules. Now, what, what rules come up the most? Do you get a lot about the headbutt rule? Do you get a lot about the... Uh, I, I would think with the headbutt rule, you know, when the fight's official is always a big one because of when, you know, the, you might short circuit a fight if, if, if guys uh, collide their heads early. But, but when they say rules, rules, 
what kind of things are you trying to legislate that they complain about? Well, basically, I just, I just present the rules to them. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I ask them, you know, this is the time right now to ask every question that you want to ask. And, you know, different fighters and different uh, fights that I've supervised, you know, just different questions. And, yeah, the headbutt rule comes through. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the foul rule comes through and what's going to happen if, if, if it happens this way. But uh, more than anything, you know, the referee has a, a lot of power in there. And I always tell the fighters that, you know, you know a, a fighter may get knocked down. And a lot, there are some fighters that will look at that corner to look for approval and, and telling them that they're good and they're so on and so forth. And I tell them, no, you don't look at your corner. You look at that, the, the most important person in that ring besides you and, the, and your opponent is the referee. To look at the referee and make sure you follow his count, make sure you follow his rules because he has the ability to stop the fight. He has the ability to make the fight uh, keep going on. So, you know, bottom line is you definitely have to, you know, do your homework, um, you know, if you're going to be a fighter, but you have to be do your homework. You, and people have to do their homework when they are an official. People think that being an official is an easy job. It's not an easy job. You know, uh, and when I see an official, I'm talking about uh, from being a referee to being a, a judge. People think, oh, he's, he's, he's nothing, he's nothing. You know, I mean, granted, there are some, some decisions out there where everybody has scratched their head, but that's that person. That's not boxing. There are some, uh, I've worked with a lot of good people who have heads on their shoulders to the point where, you know, the, uh, I, it makes me feel free as a supervisor because I know that I'm working with knowledgeable people, people that are going to get the job done. You know, and uh, uh, being an official, like I said, it's not an easy job, but from the outside looking in, you think that, oh, I can do that. But being an official is not an easy job. But also, for that matter, I mean, from every aspect of boxing, you think that being a manager, you think that being a promoter, you think that being an announcer oh. is an easy job. It's Oof. not an easy job. Nope. You know, every, but everybody has their opinion. And they all think they can do it when they look at you do it. Exactly. But once they're behind the mic, once they are, 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 are being an official and they, they have their name out there, you know, it, like I said, some, some of them are caught like a deer in the headlights, you know, but they don't know. The, the seat, like I always say they think that they can sit in your seat, but for some reason there are so many people out there who, or there's so many positions out there that the seat is too hot, and you cannot sit in that seat. You think you can, but you can't, you know. But it, it is what it is, you know. Uh, but like I said, boxing uh, or, or the things that I do, I just make sure that the, that the, um, the fighters, and for that matter, the officials themselves, everybody follow the rule uh, so we can have an a, a, a easy night and, and a night where everybody can say this was a good night. All right, so that's just about going to wrap it up for us with Double Jab, the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame induction weekend, May 26th, May 27th, May 28th. The rooftop, the deal in the morning with the Fan Fest on Saturday, the gala Saturday night, the induction Sunday night. Should be a terrific weekend in Atlantic City, and we're going to see some faces that we haven't seen in a long time coming back. So some eras coming back together to uh, merge this yeah, and we put gotta, it we all gotta, together. We got to say those names. We got to say Mike Tyson. We got to say Larry Holmes. And we Spinks, say Don King, Kawi, Spinks, Don Kawi. Elbaum, who did all those fights at the Tropicana. Uh, Frank Gell, Russell Peltz, Lou Duva's uh, the memory with the family. Lou passed away this year, so uh, and, and and local. Uh, uh, we have uh, Lavander Johnson, yes. uh, who's being inducted, but we have his father also being inducted. So the, you know, I think for that weekend we're gonna have a hell of a fun weekend. Arturo Gatti, yes, represented uh, Ken Condon, who brought all the big fights to Atlantic mm. City, will be part of that. Steve so Smoger, we need, them, we need him back. <laughs> yes, we need them back. Steve Smoger, <laughs> Hall of Fame referee. Uh, will will be with us as well. So www the website. Uh, 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 what the uh, A C B H O F dot com. Acronyms for Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame. Get dot everything. Com. Get everything in there. So that's our show for tonight. For Rob Scott, this is Dave Bontempo. Thanks for joining us, and for the Ice Man John Scully, made a very big contribution as well. We'll see you soon.